Good day, Convent. I am Reverend Dr. Latanya Jackson, Associate Minister at Convent Avenue Baptist Church. And I am honored to have been invited by Reverend Marie Mike and the Women's Missionary Fellowship to come to you today to offer a Bible study on closing out Women's Month as we look at re-strengthening, refocusing, and recommitting to God in this present age. Um, I greet you with the joy of the Lord on today. Please pray with me. Lord God, thank you for this time of study and impartation. Grant us your grace to receive your infallible word and help us to apply it to our daily lives as we grow in grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, welcome. We're going to get right started. Um, so I was given the task of coming to you and illuminating um, the book of Esther, uh, sharing a little bit about her story so that I could, uh, if you will, highlight or, or bring together, um, culminate uh, the Bible studies for Women's, His for Women's Month. And so I must be honest with you and share that when I first heard this theme, re-strengthening, refocusing, recommitting to God's church in this present age, I was drawn to the prefix, um, much like uh, one of the ministers that came before me, uh, I was drawn to that prefix re, R-E, right? Um, because the prefix tells us not only tells us that the verb is describing a repeated or recurring action. And so re-strengthen means to strengthen again, right? To make strong, to reinforce the knowledge we have in the Lord being our strength and our shield, our hearts trust in God. Then we learned about refocusing. Um, refocus is to adjust one's focus, right? To be sober-minded and watchful. And then there was recommitment. To be recommitted is to commit again or to entrust oneself. So we commit our way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. So the prefix re means to do that action again, do that verb again, because verb is an action word, right? So with your permission, I'd like us to consider how all of these three tenets envelops our service to God in this present age. It is interesting that we've chosen to highlight the book of Esther as an illustration since it doesn't speak of God, not even once. You won't find God's name anywhere in the book of Esther. It is one of the two books in the Bible named after a woman. And the story of Esther is remarkable because it is a living example of God's providence. It is a reminder of how God arranges and rearranges situations that allows or directs us to come unto him. It reassures us, us of his love and his protective care. So as women, and even as young women, young girls, we are often told or taught that there are things that we cannot do. The story of Esther in the Bible is one of God's many examples that shows us how wrong this is. See, I have also heard that people believe that women were not valued in the Bible. And again, that is wrong. Women like Esther and Ruth and Deborah have not only been valued, but they have paved the way for our Messiah, Jesus the Christ. For Esther gives us a clear depiction of what it looks like to regain her inner strength, to become laser focused and recommit to God in, the, in her present age, right? During the time that she was <clears throat> placed in power. The book of Esther essentially gives us a record of how a group of people willingly walked out of the will of God, right? The Jews, they turned their backs and they, will, they willingly walked out of God's will, but God still kept them. God still protected them from the shadows. The children of Israel were in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. King Cyrus declared they could return to their land. 
The problem was that they had gotten comfortable in Persia. This is the map behind me. They got comfortable and New Jerusalem had been destroyed. So why go back? Less than 60,000 Jews returned like God commanded. And through Esther's story, we see what was happening to the Jews in Babylon after captivity. Though the people living in Babylon are not in God's will, God still directs them and protects them. How does God do that? <laughs> By God's providence. You see, God's people in a foreign land, rebellious to his order to return, are out of the will of God. They never utter a word of prayer. In fact, the only spiritual discipline mentioned is when they fast. They forgot who they were in God. Or so it may seem. Esther's story did not begin in Persia. But back in the land of Israel, hundreds of years earlier, God hasn't forgotten. He still directs them by his providence. Providence is means by which God directs all things, both seen and unseen, good and evil, toward a worthy purpose, which means his will must finally prevail. You see, God's name may not be mentioned in the book of Esther, but he is literally on every page directing the events of history to accomplish his will. Somebody has to hold this thing together. Providence is the way God directs this universe. He's moving it into tomorrow. Providence means that God still provides. God will, God shall, God continues to provide. And as we lead into the story of Esther, we find that this young woman noted to be full of courage and faith. She is one of my, well, not one, but she is one of my favorite biblical figures because of her complicated story. Esther has a complicated story and depending upon the lens in which you see her through, uh -huh, the story may take a shift. Esther is a woman of courage and faith. That is how she is noted. And in Hebrew, her name actually means hidden. And what's so interesting about that, her name means hidden the same way God's intervention was hidden throughout her entire story. You see, on the surface, all we see is a dramatic tale of Mary at first sight. But behind the scenes, every development was intimately guided by God's hand. Let's look at some of the characters in this tale. So you have Queen Esther. First in this Bible study, we need to delve into what led Esther to the palace to begin with, right? So in the third year of the reign of King Ahasuerus, sometimes called King Xerxes, the king made a feast for himself, his officials and servants and nobles. And the king reigned over 27 provinces in the Persian empire. So you can only imagine how elaborate this feast was. He spent 128 days showing off his kingdom, then held a feast. You see, he went all out, the finest furnishings, the wine served in golden cups where there were no two alike. He was a very rude and prudent and, and, and mean and disrespectful respectful man, right? Queen Vashti, Queen Vashti. The king had a beautiful queen named Vashti. She also gave a feast in the palace for her women during this time. And on the seventh day, the king ordered his eunuchs, his servants, to bring Vashti before him with her crown on her head. See, he wanted to show off his queen and her beauty, but Vashti refused not only to be summoned, she refused to be paraded around and disrespectful and disrespected, right? So she did not come to the king. There was a dilemma that arose. Typically, when you're holding your feast, the men and women remain separated. So the fact that he had called her under, and he was drunken at the time with his royalty, with his royal court, she knew, she understood how she was going to be berated and how she was going to be treated. 
But the dilemma that now arose is that the king has a real public relations dilemma on his hands here. How can he respond to this obvious public refusal? He speaks to his wise, wise men, who the Bible tells us are all too familiar with the king's temperament. He asks them, what should he do about Queen Vashti? Men, I'm going to need you to stop talking to other men about your wives and talk to the Lord and figure out what to do when you come up under difficult situations and you don't know how to deal with and manage your household. The wise men remind the king that basically everyone witnessed this refusal. And if this was not dealt with, then all the women would think that they could just go around defying their husbands. They felt it would be a situation of, well, if the queen did it, so now we can do it. Uh-huh. So they suggested the king that, that she be cast out and stripped of her role of queen and of the royal crown. The king, what does he do? He agrees. He agrees and he sends a letter out to everyone, making sure that it was understood that by all that basically the man is the master of his home. Mm -hmm. Enter Queen Esther, the third character. So now the king is short of queen and he decides he needs to find a new queen. So in this sort of an ancient version of The Bachelor, if you will, he chooses to essentially have a pageant of sorts. He brings all the young women out, the young maidens, parades them around for his, for his, for his enjoyment. All these beautiful women from across his kingdom are brought into the women's quarters in Shushan and the Citadel, given beauty treatments and would each appear before the queen, before the king. Esther's background. So let's revisit who she is, right? Esther was now that we have explored the story a bit more. She was a Jewish woman. And again, Esther's Hebrew name was Hadasha, which means Myrtle. Or um, for some, it meant Moonstar. Esther was the cousin of a man named Mordecai. And Esther lived with her cousin, Mordecai, since she was a little girl due to her having been an orphan. The Bible doesn't give us much more information about Esther's past than that, right? She's of bloodline royalty. She is a kindred of King Saul. It is, it, but it was with Esther's future that the word concerns itself. Esther was one of the women chosen to be taken and placed in the care of one of the eunuchs who was in charge of all of the women. Mordecai warns her not to reveal that she's a Jew. He knew it would not bode well for her if they found out she was a Jew. Remember, Jews fleed to Persia because they were being, they were being exterminated. So at this time, Mordecai is once again looking out for her well-being. But there's a pattern that's ensuing here, right? Um, being silenced, remaining hidden. Um, if you would, remaining obscure and um, doing as you're told. And it was as though Mordecai knew having a Jewish queen in place would be for such a time as this. So when the Jewish people needed her most, Esther was going to find herself in a place and in a position to be able to act and to be able to, um, to save her people from extinction. You see, Mordecai's wisdom proved to be what saved the Jewish people ultimately. She became a favorite of Haggai, the eunuch, so he ensured that she would receive the finest treatment, right? He included beauty treatments beyond what the others received, but God bestowed favor on Esther. And she finally appears before the king who loved her above others, and he crowns Esther as queen. Esther's beauty and her demeanor had won the king over. We'll get to her demeanor in a minute because it juxtaposes that Queen Vashti. Who was Haman? Haman is another character in the story, right? Haman was a trusted and highly esteemed official in the court of the king, and he had received a great promotion and high position. He was above all the king's courts and essentially number two in the kingdom. So sometime later, Mordecai was told of a plot by the two of the king's eunuchs, the two of the king's servants, 
that they were setting out to kill the king. He relayed this information to Esther, who then was able to tell the king of this plot on behalf of Mordecai. Everyone would bow down to Haman, but Mordecai. Mordecai only bowed before the Lord. So when Haman learned of this, he was outraged that Mordecai would disrespect him in that way. He also learned that Mordecai was a Jew. So Haman hatched an evil plan and plotted to kill not only Mordecai, but all of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Lots were cast to determine the day that this plot would be carried out, and it was to be the 13th day of Adar. Then Haman goes to the king to inform him of these people, the Jews who, who set themselves apart from the people and the king's laws. He basically paints them as being rebellious against the king and his rule. He convinced the king to destroy God's people by paying people a bounty for killing them. Letters were sent out, sealed with the king's signet to all the provinces, instructing them to destroy, kill, and completely rid the land of the Jews, regardless of age or gender. What is the enemy's plan against God's people? The enemy's plan is to still kill and destroy. The enemy doesn't have any new tricks, right? So as we learn about that, then we go on to learn a bit more about Haman's plot. Mordecai learns of this decree and he tears his clothes and puts sackcloth and ashes, a, a sign of deep mourning and sorrow, as well as an act of humility and repentance before God. And then he goes out into the city. News reached Esther mm -hmm, of her cousin. So she sent clothes to Mordecai to remove his sackcloth, but he refused to accept the clothing. Esther sends uh, one, of the, uh, one of the king's servants to find out what was happening and why Mordecai was in sackcloth and ashes. And Mordecai tells the servant of the plot and gives him a copy of the decree. He asks for Esther to go in before the king to plead for the life for her people. But Esther sends a message to Mordecai. And she reminds him that anyone who goes into the inner court of the king without being summoned was to be put to death. What good would she be to her people if she was put to death for even approaching the king without being called? Again, this pattern of being obscure, doing as you're told, staying in your place. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you were made for such a time as this. Mordecai sends word to maybe not so gently remind her, right? He's a little obstinate with her. And he needs to remind her that she too is a Jew. And she is also a target of this decree. Hiding behind the palace is not going to save her. And in more direct terms, he was letting her know that she too was dead if she didn't go before the king. You see, the palace and her positions offered her no protection. The king could not defy his own decree. And if it, was the, if it was discovered that Esther was a Jew, regardless of being queen, she also would be put to death. Mordecai sends word, and you can almost hear his chastisement of Esther, that, that God may in in essence, very well sent help to the Jews in some other way, but that help would not reach her nor her family legacy if she fails to take action. Mordecai, Mordecai. He reminds her that God may have placed her in the role for she is in for such a time as this, right? Even though, again, God is not mentioned, but the inference is that she's been placed in her position. She's been, um, she's been positioned, right? And she's been hidden. Uh-huh. She's been hidden while in preparation until time for her to go public with her presentation. So let's not suppose that merely because we happen to be in royal places merely because we happen to be elevated 
in our, in our personal places, whether in the church house, whether in the schoolhouse, whether on our jobs, whether in the communities, right? That, that we will escape any more than our beloved brethren and our sisters um, because we have position. Position doesn't uh, remove us, uh huh. not only from our obligations, but from God's hands upon us, right? Um, and with God, there's not only joy and love and peace, there is wrath. There are consequences to actions. And so for the word says, for if you fail to speak up now, relief and deliverance will, will always come. It will come to the Jews from a different direction. So sometimes if we fail to speak up, if we fail to be in place, if we fail to move forward with what the Lord has positioned us and placed us to do, relief will come. God will raise up another because we're not the only ones. I know we think we're the latest and the greatest. I know we think that if God removes us, there will not be another. I know we believe that we are preaching, you know, proficiently and, you know, and we're in, in all of our prowess. But God will and has and will continue to raise up others if we don't do what God has so ordered, what God has positioned us to do. And, you know, we recognize, we do know. Um, those of us that have been placed, those of us that have been set aside, those of us that have been called out, we are well aware and of what our, of what our assignments are, right? And um, what we should be and could be doing uh, for not only for the people in the house. And this is why I kind of stared away from um, to serve this present age in God's church, church mm, to serve this present age, to serve God in this present age, right? The Bible talks about how we are trained up to go out. And in the church, I believe, and I, I, I see that we've become so, and not just this church, the church of God, we have become so insular. We think that the things and the gifts that the Lord has given us and what we've been called to do, it is for the house. No ma'am, no sir. It is to be trained in the house. It is to be um, not to forsake the fellowshipping of the saints. Yes. Not to be, tr to be trained up. Yes. To be firmed up in the study and in the beliefs to be reaffirmed, but then to go out to make disciples. We are light and salt to the earth realm, right? So that you have to go out so that you can be light in dark places. You have to go out so that you can be salt and you can, you can create flavor in those places that lack flavor, right? So that you can show up in spaces and they know that Jesus or the light of the world has come in. And that doesn't mean that you walk around toting Bible verses. It doesn't mean that you walk around speaking in tongues when you walk into a setting. But when you step into a space, something in the atmosphere should shift. There should be some realization that Jesus has just stepped into the room right? Because of what you carry on the inside. And so, yes, there is place. And yes, we definitely want to build up and edify our church and, and where we serve and where, um, and the place that is feeding us. But it is to edify, our goal, our ultimate call is to edify the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God does not reside within four walls. It just does not. And so, as we go out, if you fail to speak up now, relief and deliverance will come from a different direction. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows whether you didn't come into your royal position precisely for such a time as this. Uh-huh. And so as we continue, <clears throat> as we continue down the story, um, line Mordecai was letting her know that the faith of the Jewish people, including her own life, had been placed in her hands. You see, this is exchange at the heart of this Bible study because it applies to us today as well. You too were made for such a time as this, for such a time as right now, my God today, as we look and we see what is happening in culture. It starts in small, little droplets, right? Evolution of a, of a puddle can become a pond, 
that turns into a lake, that turns into a typhoon, right? So it's the little things, the little things like taking prayer out of schools that turns into now we want to teach your children about Satanism in schools, that turns into, oh, act. Um, uh, race used to be the civil rights movement that then becomes, it's no longer out, about race, but now the new civil rights movement is about gender. And now it's not about gender. Now it's about identity. It's the little things, right? That we don't pay attention to. It's the small things that spoil the vine. And so I'm wondering, where are we? Where are the upsters that have been called out? And and not Esther as an Esther as in a young adult, Esther as in your call, right? Who, where you as women, young adult women, women, elder women, all women, where are you and how are you serving this present age? Yes, there are things that we can look at and there are, there are devices that we can use as technology has evolved so that now we have a wider reach right? Um, and then we have knowledge at our fingertips and we can reach people quicker than going out two by two on foot. But there is something to be said about a personal touch. There is still something to be said about showing up, right? And being in that space, right? And calling people together, right? And then having that personal conversation that then spills over into action. I'll keep reading through the story. So you too were made for such a time as this. Do we look at where God has placed us at this very moment? Do we look at that? I used to argue, I used to not argue, but I used to be concerned, if you will, right? About um, certain places that I used to work, where I was employed. And um, I knew specifically when I felt, when I saw the enemy working against me. I knew specifically, hands down. Then I would always question, Lord God, why am I here? Like, why, why am I here? Not why am I here in this role? Why am I here at this specific time with this, with these specific people? It is this my assignment? And if it is, show me what it is. Show me who it is. And without fail, without fail, the Lord would show me the who or the what my assignment was, right? And so do we look at where God has placed us, not where we've placed ourselves, not where we've called our, not where we've called ourselves to. And I'm gonna say it because I'm me and God bless me. I mean, God bless you and God bless me as well, but, but God knows me, right? And um, I am always in prayer about Lord, direct me, direct me in my speech, direct me in my demeanor, direct me in my deportment. So I'm going to say, even in ministry, when you look, when I say, where are we? Everyone wasn't called to preach. If nobody else is going to tell you, I'm going to tell you. Everyone wasn't called to preach. And so when you think about ministry, the total sum of ministry is not the pulpit. I know it looks great. That's where everybody's focus is. That is where everybody clamors to be for whatever the particular reason is without the understanding of the weight that comes with sitting there, right? Without understanding the judgment that comes with sitting in, without understanding the accountability that comes with being in that space. But everybody wasn't called to preach. How do I know? Because my Bible tells me some he gave, some, some were apostles, some pastors, some prophets, some. Everybody wasn't called to do the same thing because then where would the eye, what, how would the eye operate without the foot? How does the hand operate Without the ear, how does the mouth operate without the head? Everybody wasn't called to the same function in ministry and understand that gift of health, whether it's administration 
whether it's sweeping the floor, whether it's ushering, whether it is in teaching, whether it is in exhortation, whether it is in discipleship, whether it is even, we are all called to evangelize. I understand that. But we are all not called to pastor and to preach. And so the part of the reason why when we talk about refocusing, restrengthening, and recommitting, really ask the Lord, okay, God, I went through MDIF and I got licensed, but what did you call me to do? And I can take my MDIF and my license and go and do the saith the Lord. So many ministries are not functioning properly. Churches are dysfunctional because people have not been placed in the areas of giftings to lead. So if everyone's sitting on a pulpit, but you've been called to intercessory prayer, if everyone is sitting on a pulpit, but you've been called to teach, if everyone is sitting on a pulpit waiting for an opportunity to say the call to worship, but you, my dear heart, have been called to prison ministry, what then does saith the Lord? And so I'm going to get off my soapbox and go back to teaching. So Queen Esther chooses to go to the king because of her cousin Mordecai's bidding. She has to refocus and have put laser sharp focus on now, right? Because she understands that her position is not going to save her from persecution. And she understands that perhaps the Lord has had her planted in her position because that has been her place of preparation. And now she is ready for public presentation. Uh huh. So Queen Esther chooses to go to the king and she tells Mordecai to go to all the Jews in Shushan and have them fast for her as she would also be doing if she dies going before the king, then so be it. If I die, then I die. So to that point, you've been called, you've been set apart, you've been elected, you've been and so if you really honestly believe that has been to sit up front, then do we all take on that same stance? This is what I've been sent, called to do. And if I die, then I die. I need us to really understand because I think that we have um, relegated pastoring, preaching, to some level of commonality because you become so comfortable with the people that lead in that facet. So you don't recognize we've no longer, we've, we, we've in some, some way, somehow we've removed the level of not only honor, right? But the level of responsibility that they carry, the level of accountability that they have not only to the people, but to the Lord. So at the end, so not understanding that heavy is the head that wears the crown. And it's not for your five seconds of fame when you think you've gotten up and given a mighty word or rendered a, 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 a superfluous prayer or read, you know, uh, powerfully or pontificated um, through tithes and offering, no ma'am, no sir. No, no, there is a weight that comes with this, with ministry. And that's at a leadership position perspective, right? There's also a weight that comes to any of us that have been called and set apart and we call on the name of Jesus and call ourselves children of God. If I die, then I die. If I perish, then I perish. Queen Esther's banquets. Esther goes to the king and the Bible tells us that she found favor with him. 
He wasn't angered by her appearance before him without, with, even though she went without being summoned. In fact, he even asks her what she would like from him, even up to the half of his kingdom. He was ready to give her half of the kingdom. Let me tell you something. Mordecai, I mean, excuse me, King Xerxes had probably had his full of Queen Vashti because she was beautiful. And even though, you know, and she was, even though she, and you can tell that she was, she had a brain. And she was obstinate to some degree. And it was like, no, I'm not doing that. And so Queen Esther was the juxtaposition of Queen Vashti. Even though I will tell you, Queen Vashti was my girl. So we'll talk about her another time. But she was in juxtaposition. She was very, um, self. I don't want to say self-deprecating, but very obscure, very humble. And people, people, could, people confuse humility with confidence right? Because someone is confident does not mean that they lack humility for people in the cheap seats, okay? And so she was humble, but there was also a pattern that was going on with her in her life where Mordecai raising her as an uncle, her being always taught um, and just Jewish tradition Women were, and particularly young girls, were seen and not heard, right? Um, hide who you are, hide your beauty, you know, um, let the males speak on your behalf. And that's part of their tradition as well. So I also want us to understand the cultural context of which I'm coming from. So she's operating in her context, right, for such a time as this. But she's also very strategic and keen. Mm -hmm. So again, he, he asks of her, what would she like? Even up to half of his kingdom, he was just ready to give her everything. And Haman's narcissistic ego, his right-hand man, certainly was piqued by her request and the king and Haman attended their banquet because that was her request. Please come to my banquet because what she was doing is that she was using his own devices against him. She knew that he liked to party and drink. So I'm going to throw you a party and I'm going to feed you what you like. And I'm going to give you the libation so that I can get you in a headspace, right? Where I can then meet you where you are. How many of us focus and are wise enough to go out and be amongst but not be, be not become part of. You can go out and meet people where they are, but that doesn't mean that you, they should have, they should have, that doesn't mean culture should be able to shift you. You should be shifting culture. You, your presence alone should be changing the way in which people see and think and feel first about themselves, about, about Christians, right? Because being a Christian doesn't mean that I have to be tight and stifled and that I can't laugh and joke and have a good time, but I'm not going to conform to the world to make them feel comfortable about being in my presence. I'm not going to conform and operate in ways that are antithetical to who I say I am in Christ. If I'm not going to, if there are certain things that I couldn't do standing in front of Jesus, then, there are, then those are the things that I'm not going to do when Jesus is not supposedly in my presence. Although I am clear that Jesus is always in my presence because God walks with me, right? So the king goes on. He enjoys the banquet. Um, and then <laughs> they enjoy the banquet and they thoroughly ask again, what would she like from him? And then she tells him she's going to throw him another banquet and she would like for him to come to that one. And so he agrees again. Now his right-hand man, is his ego is peaked. What is this about? Why does she want to throw another banquet? But he's impressed because the king keeps inviting him. The king keeps giving him a seat at the table. So instead of him being on his job, right, and paying attention to the wit and paying attention to the strategy she's ensuing, He's more impressed with the fact that he got an invitation to the table to sit with the king, right? Because no one else did. 
And so Haman's ego is now in full throttle and he runs and tells all his friends and family that, um, that other than the king, Esther invited no one else but him. However, on his way home to tell them this news, he runs into the man he hated more than anything, anyone else, Mordecai. And Haman tells his friends and family that regardless of all his good fortune, it is ruined by the sight of Mordecai. It is ruined by this Jewish man who refused to bow down to him. And Mordecai, again, refuses to bow down because the only person he bows down to is God. And so him so full of himself, he's talking with his family and friends. And again, these people, who is in your ear? Who are you listening to? Right? Who are you giving ear to that has the power to talk you into things that may not be of God, that may not be for your best interest? So they tell him, oh, you know what you should do? You should erect a gala and plan to have him hanged. And they tell him he should suggest this to the king um, that Mordecai be hanged on it and then go enjoy the banquet. He agrees to this, right? So again, so now what happens is, turn the page, the king is having a problem sleeping. And so because of his insomnia, um, what he does is that he calls for one of his servants and he was like, you know what? Let me just read this book of records. Um, and because he keeps a book of records of things that have happened, those things that are notable, things that he wants to remember. And so he starts to read through them because he figures, oh, that'll help put him to sleep. And when he is reading, what he does is that the Lord, once again, is intervening, God's providential care, and revisits the time the plot to kill him was discovered. And it was revealed by Mordecai, who saved the king's life. And so the king then asks officials what was done for Mordecai for this act of kindness. He saves the king's life from an assassination plot. And they told they didn't do anything for Mordecai. So he summons none other than Haman, his right-hand man, the one who cannot stand and who has built a pit, if you will, who has dug a grave literally for Mordecai. He calls Haman into the court at the time without mentioning Mordecai by name. And he asks him, what should be done to honor this man? Haman and all his great narcissism, right? Because you, you assume it's you. You assume that you're the one that's going to be honored. You assume that you're the one that should be, your name should be the one that's up in light. He says to him, oh, you should give him a royal robe that has been worn by the king and you give him a horse and that the king has ridden with the royal crest and you put a crown on his head and you parade him around for all the people in the city to see so everyone could know that the king honors this man. So the king tells Haman, okay, hurry. Yeah, go do all of these things. And I want it done for the Jew named Mordecai. Mm -hmm. Can you just picture the look on his face when he heard this? Not only did Haman have to witness this being done for Mordecai, but he had to be the one to lead him through the city himself. Oh, my God. And so Haman, like a jealous child, goes on. He goes home and he complains to his family yet again. But this time he is seething. And so when the king eunuch comes to bring him to Queen Esther's second banquet, what happens is at the banquet, the king asks the queen again, what is it that I can do for you? What can I give you? And Esther begins to tearfully, tearfully beg him and tell him and plead for the life of herself and the life of her people, because we have been sold I and my people for destruction, slaughter, and annihilation. And if we had simply been sold as male and female slaves, I would have remained silent for, for such distress would not be worth disturbing the king. And the king demands to know who would dare to think to do this to his queen and her people. And Esther points to Haman. Who would dare? Haman has been taken away and hanged on the very same gallows that had been erected for Mordecai. The hell, the pit, the fall, the anguish, the truth set up for other people. Be careful. 
God has his hands on God's people. And what you set up for someone else's demise ends up being the pit that you have dealt or dug for yourself. His family is executed as are thousands of would-be attackers. The king gave all that had belonged to Haman to Queen Esther and appointed Mordecai, the one he had set up to be killed over the house of Haman. Purim, a Jewish religious feast, was mandated to become commemorated each year. Haman was defeated and the Jewish people were saved. How do you ask? God's providential care. God is able. God is able to keep us from falling. God is able to keep us even when we don't see God, right? God's protective care and his reassuring love was with Esther and the Jewish people even during this time. She was set up, set apart to lead in that present age. People of God, we've been set up and set apart to lead. It is a reminder, this story is a reminder of how God arranges situations that allows or direct us to come to him. The story is remarkable because it is a living example of God's providence. It is a living example of God's providence. You see, we can lean into the story of Esther. We can lean into the story of Queen Vashti. Oh, she has a story to tell as well. But what I want us to lead in today is our own stories, right? The ways in which God is always speaking to us, leading us, restrengthening us, helping us to refocus and calling us to recommit unto God to serve this present age. Don't ever doubt that God is able. Nothing is impossible without him, for the story has a miraculous work and power all over it. Our stories have miraculous work and power all over it through every chapter of our lives, every page of our storybook that we have turned. God has been in every word. There is a constant thread of redemption through our own stories that speak to our lives still today. Things in our life haven't always gone the way in which that we want. It hasn't always been uh, gold, gold staircases, right? But God has always been with us. God, is walk, God continues to walk with us. God continues to talk to us. God continues to lead and guide us. God continues to favor us. Are we listening? Are we distracted by not only the cares of this world, but by the culture? By the things that are happening around us, to us, for us, and sometimes not for our good. There are times where we have to turn off social media, turn off technology, so that we can make sure that this direction, communication going this way, is unhindered and untethered. Have we decided to truly follow Jesus? I know we sing about it all the time. I have decided to follow Jesus. But have we really decided? No turning back. Because the, the song says, the world behind me the cross before me. And sometimes that just means that we have to say no so, to certain things that feel good. Say no to some invitations that we may want to accept. Say, let me, let me get back to you. And actually check in with the Lord to see if this is a yes. Not, oh, I've been invited because it feeds, because what happens is that, I'm gonna just do a little therapeutical, right? It feeds 
the thing in us, the gap, the insecurity, right? It feeds something in us. It feels good to want to be invited, right? To have a seat at the table, to be a part of the clique, to be a part of the group, to be a, it feels good to be asked. It feels good to spend time with. But what about feeling good with spending time with the Lord? What about being called and spending good and feeling good about recommitting not only our lives, but our time, our talents, and our attention to God, to God. God will direct where that needs to go, where you need to go, right? Where that time, talent, and attention, and time, where that needs to be spent. I'm saying to God, right? If I'm called to serve in a house, then I'm clear about that. And I'm clear about that. And I know that my time, my talents, and my attention, and my tithes, that's where it belongs. If I'm called to a hospice, if I'm called to the nursing home, if I'm called to a prison house, if I'm called to the military, if I'm called, if I'm called to my family, right? And both things can be true. It can be a both end. But first and foremost, the relationship here has to be right before I can start going out here. And it's not about what everybody else around me is doing and what looks glamorous, what looks to be, because a lot of, honey, we live in filter. We live in filter. Filters on social media. We filter our lives. We are history revisionists. Yes. All of a sudden we were and we did and we became, well, honey, we, re, we revised our histories about who we were and what we've been doing in ministry and in God so that we go out and we get a whole new group of people we don't know that don't know us. What has God called us to do, be, live into and move forward in? And I say this because God is always at work, even when we can't see the whole story. Trust and believe. Don't think that your small beginnings are any less than what you're looking at with someone else. We don't know what the someone else had to go through. We don't know the loss. We don't know the pain. We don't know what they've had to give up. We don't know the sacrifices. Don't look at your small beginnings as anything less than. God can make take a little and turn it into a lot. And if we are focusing, if we are refocusing our attention on what God has for us, even when things look uncertain, and that, set, that sets the stage for great things to happen. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Let me tell you, we are living in an age of technology, right? And so a lot of our elders are not technology proficient, but God has called those of us who are for such a time as this to be able to go in. And these, this is the new highway and byway, right? To share God's work, to be able to reconnect with individuals. This is still fellowshipping this way, right? To be able to hold Bible studies, to be able to just say, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. God bless you. I pray that all is well. I'm praying for you today. I saw that you were having a hard time. Just know that I'm lifting you up. It takes two seconds. Send a scripture. God has called us for such a time as this. So that we can, so that we can, so that we can be salt in the world, right? Right now, a lot of things that are happening are dark, dark in our communities, dark in our culture, and I just pray that we are obedient to God's call, and it may even have to the power to affect an entire generation, which is what we're after. 
We are after entire generations of people, and we may never be fully aware of how our actions and faithfulness to his voice are working so powerfully in those around us. We don't have to stay stuck in fear. We don't need to run from his leading. And even when we feel incredibly unprepared mm -hmm, or inadequate for the job, God will equip us for every task and will pave the way for us to walk through his, with his power, providing grace for every step and covering us from behind. Queen Esther had a choice. We have a choice. When Mordecai sent a word to her about the great danger their people were facing, if you don't receive anything else, receive this as a clarion call of the great danger this generation is facing. We could have simply tried to save ourselves. We could keep quiet and just hope for the best or turn and go the other way. But I implore us, just as she and Mordecai both knew that God had given her great purpose in her position, know that God has given you great purpose in your position. Be wise, make a plan, don't stay stuck. Don't stay worried in fear. Pray and fast and ask for your people, those who you consider your crew, those who you consider your inner court, those you consider your prayer warriors to do the same. She was willing to act, to follow God's lead to save the lives of her people, even if it meant that she lost her own life. Are we willing to act? Are we willing to follow God's lead? Are we willing, even if it means it saves the lives of our people, be re-strengthened, be recommitted, and be refocused? to serve God in this present age. I am Reverend Dr. Latanya Jackson, and it has been my honor to serve you today. Amen. <laughs>